All right. Well, thank you for those of you who are joining us. Um, thanks for tuning in to the Canada Science and Technology Museum's Google Hangout for the Canadian Energy Literacy Network. This webinar is part of a series that we do the last Thursday of every month, and it's an opportunity to gather people who are interested in energy education and to discuss some of the issues around energy, both around Canada and around the world. A great opportunity to learn more from each other and from the expertise we have, uh, we're able to draw upon and to get some new perspectives. As always, uh, if you're a viewer, we encourage you to get involved in the discussion to ask questions or offer your perspective. Uh, just if you are wondering how to do that, if you mouse over at the top of your screen, you will be able to open a Q&A app. Uh, it'll open up on the side of your screen and just type in any questions and our presenters will get to them as soon as they're able to. Aussi, je veux mentionner que toutes les présentations aujourd'hui seront en anglais, mais uh, pour toutes les personnes qui regardent chez vous, um, j'encourage de demander la que les questions dans la langue de votre choix. Donc, uh, si on peut, on va répondre en français ou moi je vais faire une traduction. Today, we're going to be talking about energy in the north. Um, providing en energy in an affordable and accessible way to remote northern communities is a serious challenge. Many communities in the north uh, are not connected to any regional electrical grid and rely on diesel generations for their communities. Uh, many of these communities uh, can only get fuel intermittently, depending on sea conditions or on ice roads. And the costs and environmental impacts of this sort of energy can be significant. There are, however, new technologies that are diversifying the energy options for communities and people living in the north. Today we have two experts on this topic of energy in the north. We have Lawrence Kite, who is a Northern en Alternative Energy Specialist with Polar Knowledge Canada. He works with Northern Canadian communities to facilitate sustainable energy projects and increase local capacity through clean energy products. And he helps them in selecting renewable energy technologies that will be adapted for their northern locations. As well, we're hoping that to have Teresa Chilkowicz, who will be joining us shortly, She's engaged in community um, stewardship, environmental education, uh, and other building activities for nearly the last 20 years. Her current position is as a regional energy project coordinator with the Arctic Energy Alliance. It's an organization which partners with individuals and communities in commercial and industrial energy management solutions to deliver practical energy saving solutions. And I see Teresa's joined us, so that's great. We're going to give uh, Lawrence the mic first. He's going to unmute himself and uh, tell us a little bit about his work at Polar Knowledge Canada. And then we're going to turn it over after that to Teresa. So welcome, Lawrence. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'm Lawrence Keat. I'm the Northern Sustainable Energy Specialist with Polar Knowledge Canada. And uh, happy to be talking today. Uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about our agency, Polar Knowledge Canada, and lead into uh, three very brief uh, overviews of uh, three case studies of renewable energy projects in the north that are under development or in operation. So uh, I d just on the cover slide here before I move into the presentation, what we're looking at is uh, Cambridge Bay, which is the headquarters for uh, our Canadian High Arctic Research Station, which is being built currently. Um, what you see, the two buildings that you see there are the triplexes that will be housing uh, 45 visiting researchers at any time uh, through the course of the year. Uh, Lawrence, uh, and if you just share your screen there, we're not seeing your image quite, quite yet. Gotcha, okay, let me see, good point. Okay, screen one. So what you are now looking at, <laughs> perfect. Okay, good. Um, So you see the two, this is Cambridge Bay, and the two triplexes. Uh, what's not built yet is the main research building. Uh, it's under construction, and it'll be finished uh, at the end of next year and fully in operation by uh, 2018. And there's also a field and maintenance building, which is under construction. So I'll talk more about those in a minute. So what is Polar Knowledge Canada? Uh, we, we refer to ourselves as Polar, so if I say Polar, that's our agency. We're a new and innovative Government of Canada agency. Uh, we will be based in the north. Uh, we're currently mostly um, in Ottawa, but as the uh, CHARS, which is a Canadian Higher Arctic Research Station, uh, nears completion, we'll be slowly transferring our staff 
up to Nunavut and of course hiring in Nunavut and in the north to have northerners up there. So we report to the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs and our mission is to advance knowledge of the Canadian Arctic, uh, trying to improve economic opportunities, environmental stewardship and quality of life. Uh, we're also responsible for other circumpolar regions such as Antarctic. Um, we want to strengthen Canada's leadership on Arctic issues and establish a platform for science research in the Canadian Arctic. We're, we're relatively new. We, uh, we've just been in existence to, since June of last year and we came about from the merger of the Canadian Polar Commission and CHARS, which is Canadian Higher Arctic Research Station. So uh, we are small and we're nimble as a federal agency. We're, we're able to connect uh, all the various Ottawa departments and agencies involved in the north as well as um, respond quickly to the needs of, uh, of the northern communities we work with and our partners. There's three main functions of Polar. The first is the knowledge management component. Uh, so this program is focused on knowledge mobilization, on communication, community engagement, and on incorporation of traditional knowledge into science. Uh, the second is the Pan Northern Science and Tech Program, and that has four main components. So the alternative and renewable energy is where I sit, and uh, there's also cryosphere, um, baseline monitoring, and infrastructure. So I'll talk a little more about, of course, renewable in a second. Uh, the third component is the Canadian Heritage Research Station, which is under construction. You see a nice photo of its current state right now. And uh, as I mentioned, it will be finished by the end of next year. It's going to be a, a really a world-leading, cutting-edge research station with, um, with a whole space that's open to the public, the community of Cambridge Bay, who are um, very happy to be hosting this, and, uh, and then um, various types of science labs in the other uh, half of the building. Here's a little blow up of the campus on the left. You see the main research building and the uh, maintenance building and the triplexes. Upper right is a triplex and lower right is the campus location within the community. So moving into the case studies, we have uh, our scope really with our energy projects is the three uh, territories in the north. So from west to east, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and uh, of which Nuviadwit is a part in the, in the orange. Then there's Nunavut in the light green, Nunavik, which is northern Quebec, and Nunatsivut in the purple. So our, we have uh, project interests uh, throughout this region as well as Canadian, uh, as well as in Cambridge Bay. And the three projects I'm going to briefly talk about now are the three red dots, which is uh, Fort McPherson Northwest Territories, Iqaluit um, Nunavut, and then Inukjuak in Nunavik. So the first is the Inuvik Hydro Project. Uh, it's, it's still in development, so it's not in operation, uh, but it's a very interesting run of river project in the, in the community of Inukjuak. It's actually being developed to provide 100% of Inukjuak's uh, heat and power needs over the next 30 years. Inukjuak's a community of 1,600 people, so it's quite a, it's quite a large project, 7.5 megawatts, and um, it's been driven by the community's desire for greater energy autonomy. Creation of local jobs is, is really big in, in most northern communities. Uh, Inukjuak actually has the low, the highest unemployment rate in Nunavik. Um, they're talking about 20 to 30 jobs associated in the construction phase and then uh, several jobs afterwards in operation and maintenance. Huge driver for this project. Uh, and the community is interested in replacing the, the diesel which typically runs 24-7 in, in most northern communities uh, in the middle of town and, um, and they will want to replace it with renewables, decrease their carbon footprint. This is uh, an important project because uh, the proponent would not go ahead without community support. So they had a referendum and 83% uh, voted in support. So strong support for this, again, driven, driven by the jobs. The, I should mention one barrier to this has been um, there's, a, there's a lack of a transparent power purchase pricing mechanism <coughs> throughout much of the north. So in other words, if a proponent wants to sell energy back to the utility when they develop a project, 
uh, there's no common formula to assess the true avoided cost of diesel. Uh, this is an issue because proponents such as these need need uh, not just the the exact price of what diesel is being offset, but they they need other considerations factored into that price. I won't get into those details, but it's um it's it's been a barrier with Hydro Quebec. The project is still waiting for some additional funding and ho hoping to go ahead shortly. Um, second case study. So this is Fort McPherson. Teresa, you'll know this one. Uh, this is a biomass boiler project. It provides heat to the two community buildings you see in the background there. The boiler is housed in that container in the foreground. So this boiler is an interesting one. It's a, it's a flex fuel boiler, so it can burn cordwood, wood chips, and wood pellets to provide heat at any given time. Uh, while this is being developed as a wood chip project with the local harvest component I'll, I'll speak about, it's currently provided heat to these buildings really only through cord wood, which has been harvested locally, and, and the pellets, which are imported from northern Alberta. So what you see here is the wood chipping process. They have an abundant, fast-growing willow around the community, and they cut it, they bundle it, feed it through chippers, and uh, it goes into the hopper part of the container creates heat in the boiler and provides provides that heat. And by a strong community desire for more self-reliance in their energy picture in the community, uh, the lots of willow and a local harvesting job now with biomass, locally sourced biomass heat really stands out among the clean energy technologies we work with in terms of the opportunity to create sustainable and quite impactful long-lasting uh, employment, local employment, local economic development. And that's because of the harvesting and processing component that happens locally. So this project was really developed as a pilot in the north to see how this wood tripping would work, which has been proven out uh, quite extensively in Scandinavia, but not yet in our north. Um, they started with a pilot project on purpose, which was really good uh, that, that that was done on a small scale. Very dedicated community champion. Uh, flexible harvesting work aligned with uh, traditional um, hunting and, and fishing requirements during the year. And the willow harvest was seen to align with the Gwich'in uh, traditional practice of, of harvesting wood. Um, where the project has run into challenges is, well, the, for example, the dedicated community champion, there was one, and uh, that one person um, recently left town. And uh, there's been a, a real learning curve around the whole uh, forest management part of the, the wood shipping as well. So currently, uh, um, we're, we're working on um, keeping the pellet fuel heat going for this one and uh, and then hoping to move back into the wood chip heat once uh, once some of the kinks get ironed out. Arctic Energy Alliance, by the way, has been a huge part of that project success uh, in their support. So uh, the last one is a Callaway pilot project. This is an energy management, energy efficiency plan. Uh, in, in, Calo uh, in Nunavut, there's $120 million spent a year just to heat and power the buildings, and most of that is the public buildings. So this is a huge project to slowly move throughout Nunavut uh, to retrofit all of the public buildings with energy efficiency retrofits. You can see some of them here, are insulation, control systems. They even had solar hot water and solar air in a few buildings. Uh, program seen as a great success. Uh, the 1.7 million in savings and lots of greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, and they are currently expanding it to the Kivalik region, the 89 buildings, uh, government buildings in that region. So uh, one thing that made this one uh, very successful or even enable it to happen, period, was a, an innovative financing mechanism based uh, after the Federal Buildings Initiative, whereby a third party financer can come in and dump a whole bunch of money into Nunavut for these retrofits but get paid back with guaranteed savings from the retrofits over the course of 10 years. So what that allows is, is a, a region like this with very tight energy budgets to bring lots of money into the region. Uh, and in 10 years, once this is paid off, uh, which, which is done through the retrofits, uh, through the guaranteed savings, the, um, uh, the 
the government is left, the region is left with a whole suite of buildings that are approximately 20% more energy efficient than they were. So I'll, I'll leave you with this, this list, which I won't go through, but just to let you know, I, I've spoken about uh, efficiency and run of river, biomass, but there's all sorts of other uh, northern sustainable energy technologies that we're involved with at Polar and that, that the Arctic Energy Alliance and, and uh, other northern uh, players are, are involved with developing and operating, implementing in the north. Uh, these two pictures, the upper one is a huge turbine generating clean power in the Raglan mine, which is in northern Quebec, offsetting diesel there. And uh, the lower one is at Patterson Lake, Northwest Territories, which is a Northwest Tell remote site solar photovoltaic diesel hybrid system. Uh, so lots of applications we're involved with. And uh, I'd be delighted to, uh, if you want to continue to interact with Polar, we have a website and an app and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Really, our, one of our means of communicating with the communities uh, most successfully is through the community Facebook pages. So, uh, so we're trying to be active there. These are all available in French, um, so, uh, and I'm happy to provide that, the French information as well. And this is my business contact information, and I'd be delighted to uh, correspond or take any questions after the presentations. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, that's great. So if, uh, if you want to take that off screen share so that we can, uh, yeah. if there's any questions, we'll be able to see you. And uh, I'm going to turn it over right now to Teresa. Teresa joins us from the Arctic Energy Alliance. And uh, Teresa kind of got called in at the last moment to put this together. So uh, thanks, Teresa. Really appreciate you uh, being able to make it today and uh, tell us about the work that uh, you and the other folks at the uh, Arctic Energy Alliance uh, are up to. So I'll turn it over to you. OK, so you can probably hear me now. Do I need to do anything else for the screen? Nope, you're great. We can hear you. We can see you. OK, excellent. I see Lawrence. <laughs> All right, I see. I just click on the different things. OK. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much. As uh, Jason had alluded, um, I uh, am stepping in. Our executive director was going to offer this presentation. And ironically, I was the one that actually has been uh, originally in contact with Jason and Jonathan with the Let's Talk Energy crew, um, becoming aware of this possibility. So it's come full circle and back to me. So um, uh, interestingly, there's some lovely little connections and tie-ins <clears throat> uh, as Lawrence already uh, made a connection to with Arctic Energy Alliance and what Polar Knowledge Canada is up to with that for, uh, Fort McPherson project as well. I believe Lawrence has um, some amazing connections that uh, through our office uh, he was involved in the early stages of that Fort McPherson project um, by way of connecting with uh, some of my colleagues here at our Yellowknife office. So I think it's just a wonderful weaving of uh, of this web of our professional circles and our, our passion circles that uh, has us all connecting in some really good ways. Um, so I guess, uh, do I need to do something to get the presentation up or we just call for it when we want? Jason? Yeah, if you go to the um, left side of your screen, there is a small green box with a white arrow in it. Yep. When you're ready, just click that and you will begin sharing with the rest of the viewers. And then I'll be sharing what is on my screen then? That's correct, yeah. Awesome, and then I'll just flip it to the other uh, uh, tab that I have it on. OK, great. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll do that. Get that up here, hopefully, like that, and like that. Does that work? And there, like that. <coughs> there, that's about as high tech as I can get for everybody. Uh, okay, good. All right, so yes, um, I'm here with the Arctic Energy Alliance, and um, uh, the Arctic Energy Alliance, we've been able to um, offer quite a wide variety of uh, support and options for communities throughout the NWT and beyond. And um, as you'll see with our mission, uh, promoting and facilitating the adoption of efficient and renewable energy, practices by all members of the NWT Society. 
and uh, we're doing that in our capacity as a not-for-profit organization, a non-governmental organization that was set up in 1997. And this is where I'm sitting right here in behind those little posters. That's right. Getting, yep. So I'm just going to break in. We're not actually seeing what, what, what you have on your screen. I don't know if you have two screens growing. You might need to flip between the two. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Let me yeah, see before you get too far into this. Thank you. Um, let me see. Maybe I have to drag it over to the laptop they have here. Can you see something now? Try turning a uh, screen share off and on again now that it's on the new screen. Okay. Let me see if it's there. <laughs> Okay, and oh, I see. Yeah. So there's a screen that's coming that says full screen one, full screen two. So I want to I click on the one that I want it to be in. Okay. Are you seeing the blue screen or the? Wow. Can you see something now? I see, can't see anything. We see a blue screen right now, so I think that might be it. Okay, and this one here then? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, no, now we, there we go, perfect. Okay, excellent. And I'll back it up to where it needs to be. There, that's the beginning. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so um, this is the, uh, this is where we're located in Yellowknife, and right there is where I'm sitting in behind that window of posters. And sorry, I didn't have anything more uh, exciting to have in behind me for you know, like that, but you're looking at the presentation now, so that's fine. Um, and this is really weird, Jason. It seems to be skipping slides. I'm not sure why. Um, I'll see if I can get to it this way. Wow, it skipped to, to slide six. Okay, well, I'll just, um, it was just showing a picture of all of our other offices. Um, we have regional offices where I am in uh, Port Simpson in the, for the Detcho region. We have an office in Hay River uh, for, the South, or for the South Slave uh, Akecho region. Um, we have an office in Norman Wells for the Satu, in Wati for the Tlicho region, and in Inubik for the Beaufort Delta. And um, that would be the area uh, in closest proximity to the area that Lawrence had highlighted for the Inubi Alouic. Um, the main areas of Arctic Energy Alliance activity are um, the things that we know about and that we help uh, engage people and, and get people in action on are energy conservation, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and uh, as well as carbon offsets. Uh, the various uh, uh, groups of folks that we work with are everything from individuals and businesses, institutions, communities, um, and the various governments, First Nations, uh, Métis, Inuit, Alouette, and um, all, any and all of those local governments. Uh, sorry that I don't have these slides showing up. Um, just the next one is just the title slide about project management northern style. And so um, in the context of that, I'll just give a little overview of uh, some of the main ways that we're able to work with the communities um, to uh, help them undertake these energy management projects, uh, either more fully on their own, own or uh, with a greater amount of uh, connection through Arctic Energy Alliance. So we're able to help them make sense of, of uh, data such as this for space heating, electricity, and fuel use. And this is just a comparison showing in the darker blue um, Edmonton numbers. Uh, of dollars per liter of, of oil equivalent, and uh, Yellowknife is the dark blue, and then Saks Harbor is the light blue. So there's a significant jump when you get into the Yellowknife context from down south, and then even further uh, a, a greater jump um, when you get into the higher Arctic. <clears throat> the what of what <clears throat> Arctic Energy Alliance is doing is what it takes to get it done, and looking at long time horizons and taking small steps. And then, although each job or contract has a hard goal, we're trying to weave in as many soft goals as possible and increase the value added. So I'm trusting that everybody's seeing these slides now. <clears throat> um, the what of our approach, we're trying to partner and collaborate as much as possible, building capacity along the way, training as part of many of our projects, and liaising and being agents within the communities that we're working. <laughs> 
<clears throat> our approach to partnering. Um, we're very much aware that real partnerships require real involvement, not just optics. Um, so funds, in-kind contributions, local knowledge, materials, equipment, translation, uh, all of those factor in at, at in varying degrees. There's really no silent partners. We're trying to engage people and maintain uh, people as active partners where, as much as possible. <coughs> For communications, we can help interpret and present technical information accurately in plain language, and I can truly attest to that. Uh, the technical folks, such as the ones that Lawrence got familiar with when he was um, coming in out of our Yale and I office here, I think our staff is now about 22 people, and um, five of which of us are out in the regional offices, and the rest are, you know, some about five or six providing various admin uh, and executive uh, director finance kind of functions. But the whole rest of our crew are technical energy management specialists, uh, home energy auditors, commercial building energy auditors, and various program coordinators. And um, uh, yeah, a, a number of them have engineering qualifications. And uh, it's amazing how well they're able to help put into plain, plain language the very technical things that they're able to process. And then we're able to help the communities and uh, community members have a better understanding of what's going on with their energy use and how they can make a difference in reducing that use and reducing their energy costs along the way. So we've become a trusted independent source of energy information and advice. Uh, we're not selling products, so we're able to be providing a, a non-biased uh, uh, batch of information and, and uh, advice and guidance along the way. And um, as much as we can, translation and interpretation into some of the NWT official languages, we've been uh, endeavoring to uh, get some of our materials available. Uh, through the work that I do with the Detro First, uh, my, my office is actually based on the Detro First Nations office in uh, Fort Simpson. And um, some of the events that I've been able to uh, connect with uh, the nine, ten organizations that are part of the Detro First Nations has enabled me to present at uh, their leadership meetings and assemblies, and any time I get a chance to do that, uh, there's simultaneous translation going on with those gatherings. So it's a really nice opportunity when those partnerships uh, can, can realize such benefits. Uh, some of the types of projects that we've been able to um, help bring about, uh, one, of the, one of the significant ones has been wood stove installation projects and training for people to get um, familiar with and uh, trained up for uh, proper installation of wood stoves, as well as um, uh, the inspection side of, of installing wood stoves and pellet stoves. So it's a good fit that came um, from the Arctic Energy Alliance mission and from the community energy plans. Uh, the, the wood stove projects basically are to help get more, much more uh, efficient wood stoves into people's homes instead of the older, less efficient, uh, more polluting, um, more energy intensive wood stoves. So this is going to help reduce costs and re reduce pollution. Um, enhancing local economy and building capacity through these training opportunities. And uh, providing familiar equipment um, in the form of a wood stove, uh, but new technology and rules as it relates to their installation. And uh, on the pellet stove side of things, definitely new equipment um, that people are getting more familiar with. The WET barrier. Uh, WET uh, stands for Wood Energy Technology Transfer. And um, uh, it's, it's what's required for anybody that would be having a wood stove or a pellet stove installed. But it's quite a barrier because there's um, quite a lot involved with getting that actual certification. And there's new ins insurance regulations that um, are requiring the wet inspected installs. So what we've been able to do is provide uh, training opportunities um, in most of the regions now, at least once if not twice or three times, and providing, uh, getting the wet instructor up here and doing the detailed four or five day classroom uh, uh, instruction and then tagging on anywhere from two to four days of hands-on uh, instructional time of doing installs. And so this is an example of um, one of the chimneys that's getting installed on a new wood stove install that happened out my way in Fort Simpson about three years ago. And the fellow on the left was one of our coordinators out of our Nubik office at the time. And the fellow on the right came down for the training from, I believe, Betrico, which is just south of uh, Yellowknife. 
<clears throat> we even had a building inspector come from the city of Yellowknife uh, for that training down in Fort Simpson, uh, showing that uh, there was definitely interest for people to get in on that uh, when it was at least local to the NWT, so they wouldn't have to fly so far down. Um, so on a final sum up, uh, the key themes uh, for us have really been uh, focused around community engagement, collaboration and partnership, and training and capacity building. And uh, it's really quite interesting. Um, uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> That's really funny. I think it hopped to one of my very last slides because I still have a few other things on my printout. So let me just back up quickly. Uh, the capacity building that we were able to do in 2012 as a result of these uh, uh, wood energy technology transfer training sessions and the wood stove installations ended up uh, resulting in 17 wet compliant installs in Inuvik. Uh, Clavic installs were uh, inspected uh, by uh, the wet instructor and the, the students. It allowed students to get the hands-on experience and get credits towards certification and it resulted in compliant installs for insurance purposes. And one of the things that the insurance companies have been able to do is make an allowance that if we're at least getting um, people trained up and as students until they get their desired number of hours to actually be fully certified, the wet students can sign off as a wet student and the insurance companies um, uh, up here in the NWT are, are, are allowing that to be um, acceptable uh, so that um, at least that much is done as opposed to nothing being done and people not reporting it for the sake of their insurance. Uh, for 2013, we had the wet training I referred to in Fort Simpson as well as in Metro Cove, which I guess um, uh, Alfred had missed, so he got down to Simpson for that instead. Uh, homeowners uh, providing all the hardware in those instances and um, through our rebate program, they were able to tap into rebates, uh, but they took care of the purchasing of, of the wood stoves and the ones that they wanted to have and then um, as part of the training, we ended up um, having the students and the instructional, instructional uh, staff on hand to get all of those installations completed. So then the homeowners ended up with a free installation and um, the students ended up with hours toward their wet certification. Um, there was a picture of people putting together a hard pad that I would have shown you. And where are we now? Uh, in the Satu and for the Pitok government, um, they've conducted very successful wood stove projects on their own using the wet trained students that they've um, put through those trainings. And a certified mentor, they've ended up installing 50 to 80 additional stoves in their respective communities with no involvement from AEA. And um, now we're at the final sum up. Uh, the key themes, community engagement and uh, seeking out people in the communities to identify more specifically what they're interested in and not just kind of top down, this is what we're going to install for you, or we're going to bring in these people and install and um, do these things for you, trying to get uh, the training component in there so that that uh, capacity can be built up, so they have the training and capacity building, and then the collaboration and uh, partnerships, uh, whether it's with local governments, regional governments, um, or various other community organizations and government organizations along the way. And that wraps it up, I think, with um, some decent timing there. Merci Cho, and uh, thank you and merci. Thanks, Lawrence, and thanks, Teresa. Um, so we're going to open it up to our viewers for questions. So if you do have questions, type them in. It'll take a moment for us to see them. There is a bit of a delay between what we're broadcasting and what people are seeing. So while we wait to see if there are any questions, um, I'll ask one myself. Um, and I'm just, so what I'm seeing is in, in terms of northern communities, there's, there's your three main, uh, three main uses of energy, right? You have your electrical, so appliances, lighting, things like that. Then you have uh, heating, and then you also have some fuels probably for transportation. So um, from what I'm seeing, you know, the heating, I guess, would be probably a pretty serious concern uh, with longer winters, uh, I guess also probably some of that lighting. Um, so it seems like, uh, Lawrence, you explained two versions, one with more like uh, using wood stoves uh, or the pellet stoves, and another one, the first community you mentioned was going to be um, that run of the river. So that will all be baseboard heating, I'm guessing? Uh, can you can you talk about what, what sort of um, potential you think there are for communities to get completely on to 100% renewable in any near future? 
Okay, well, that's a very good question. Um, 100% renewable um, is, is much more likely to be achieved in uh, in the Northwest, where there are two things that, uh, like Yukon and and say Southern Northwest Territories, have an advantage. One is that there's a, a huge uh, hydro component already to their to their uh, power sourcing. So large developed hydro projects. Oops, I'm getting a very funky screen. Okay, we're good. Um, uh, and second is that those two territories are below the tree line, so so they can incorporate biomass into their energy stream. So so yeah, the the, the possibility exists for 100% renewable just based on uh, just based on that combination hydro hydro and biomass. Of course, we always talk about the power side of energy, which is electricity, um, and that's in terms of renewables the the most common contributors to that. In, on the clean end are, are solar, photovoltaic, and wind in the north. Um, solar being uh, well underway in development in the, again in the northwest and just taking root now on a few projects in, in Nunavut. Uh, wind really being the two major mines, um, Diavik in Northwest Territories and, and Raglan in, in northern Quebec. Um, one, yeah, very, very uh, very little community wind in northern Canada, except uh, Alaska has developed that well. So, back to your question. Uh, let's see. I think the first part you were suggesting about the wood heat. Um, I wanted to just make the distinction between um, uh, residential wood heat and then larger building. Uh, residential below the tree line, um, the, the wood stoves uh, make a lot of sense as offsetting uh, the need for oil heat. Uh, in the larger buildings, they tend to be a boiler supplied. It's more efficient to use a, a, a biomass boiler than a, than, a, than a heating stove that radiates out the heat. So, uh, so those are larger boilers, um, and uh, Northwest Territories has already retrofitted uh, the largest 20 or so of their uh, government buildings with biomass heat just because it costs out so quickly for them. Um, and that's spread to the Yukon, who now has their own biomass strategy as well. Um, so uh, I forget your original question other than the 100% <laughs> renewable, but I just wanted to make that distinction uh, that A, we're, we're probably not too far from getting a, maybe in the next um, five to ten years we might get a, a, a poster community up in the north that's 100% renewable. It'll be in the northwest. and. Uh, and the, the biomass boiler is, is probably the way to tackle the larger building heat requirements, um, and mostly in the northwest where there are trees, although we're hoping to pilot a, a project up in, in Nunavut uh, in the next um, couple of years. That would be the first biomass heat project north of the tree line in Canada. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, and I guess what we're what I'm hearing though is that the, those obviously those transportation fuels for people's uh, you know machinery and and snowmobiles and stuff is still going to be provided with, uh, with fossil fuels for the foreseeable future, uh, which makes sense. I mean that's kind of it's trans it's, it's storable and, and easy to transport, and I, I'm not sure how some of those electric um, vehicles would would respond to some of the long extreme colds. Um, I'm hearing from um, Elizabeth that there are some questions. I'm not seeing any popping up in my view. Um, so I'm going to close my question and answer. Uh, oh, I see. If I see them on my end. Okay. Well, great. Why don't you um, start there, uh, Lawrence or Teresa? Feel free to answer those questions. I'm I'm having difficulty seeing them. And Teresa, can you hear us? And can you see the questions as well? I I can see the I can now see the questions. I'm not sure why my video went away, but we can keep looking at you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> it just says you and this generic little person in there. Um, uh, so th there's one question that says, "Are you a crown corporation?" I'm assuming that's to to you, Lawrence. We're we're uh, Polar Knowledge Canada is is officially called a departmental corporation within the federal service. So. Uh, 
in probably common parlance, we're, we're an agency. So we're a we're Northern Research Agency. We're not part of a department. Uh, we're, we're similar to Can, CANNOR, Canadian Northern Development Agency, in that, in that respect, where we, we, pro, we report to, we have a president who reports to a board who then reports to um, Carolyn Bennett, who's the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. But, uh, so we're an agency. Okay. And um, I don't think the question was directed at me because of the crown part of it, but um, the Arctic Energy Alliance uh, is a nonprofit, non-governmental organization, but there is a very strong tie-in to the GNWT, the Government of the Northwest Territories. And up until last year, uh, that tie was predominantly through the Environment and Natural Resources Department. And then for last year, that was the start of a, things transitioned over to the Public Works and Services Department. And um, I think my most simple way of explaining it is that the, any and all of the energy functions of the GNWT have now been funneled into this uh, a certain component of uh, or a certain segment of the Public Works Department. And so any funds that come our way, which is a big portion of how we exist, is these funds through the GNWT that are coming to us now through the Public Works. And I think there's some special term for the kind of connection we have to the GNWT, but I, I don't quite remember it off the top of my head. Um, I'm not sure which way we need to look at these questions, Jason, from top to bottom, but um, uh, so there's a question about speaking to yeah. anyone. You should just go from top to bottom. Like I said, I'm, I'm only seeing a very slim like word at a time. So I'm um, okay. happy if you guys can, can just take them as they come. So there's one question about um, speaking to energy literacy of communities in the north. And then there's a longer one. And then there's another one about energy efficiency retrofits on this project. Who is doing the energy efficiency? Oh, so Lawrence, the uh, energy re efficient retrofits on, on the economy project. That's the government doing really Is that correct? Yeah, the, the government uh, has is paid for, from that. There's some funding from Eco Energy, from Indigenous Affairs as well. Um, they contracted um, MCW Custom Energy Solutions to do the engineering and management uh, um, of that project, and uh, and then also Arctic College partnered with Seneca College in Ontario, who has a building environmental systems course, and that was used to train. Um, uh, through Arctic College, um, train locals that were interested in, in in doing the retrofits themselves and also managing uh, and operating those those buildings. Um, so I don't know if that specifically answers. I don't know the the on the ground um, Ikalurita companies that were contracted by MCW. Um, but uh, but it was MCW Custom Energy Solutions who were awarded the overarching contract. That's awesome. Um, okay, so then back up to the other one about energy literacy. Um, that's a good question. Um, there's so many things at any one given time on people's plate uh, that, on many levels, energy liter energy literacy really is at the tip of their tongues, but they don't know it because um, when there's talk of um, fewer resources and need for funding for doing whatever, uh, when we're able to get communities um, on board for uh, looking at where they're uh, putting their heating and electricity dollars and water use um, and reducing that and the ability for that to free up money to do other things then um, those efficiencies that are gained can help address uh, some of the things that are seemingly consuming more of their time than um, the, the lesser priority at the time on the energy front. But uh, with that said, with us now having uh, staff in all of the regional offices, um, I would like to think that the energy literacy in general is, is increasing and the community engagement that we're doing um, throughout the NWT, as well as Nunavut. Um, the Nunavut Energy Secretariat is also one of the members of the Arctic Energy Alliance. And so a couple of our folks, uh, Ken Bajant and Margaret Mahon, uh, have been out to Nunavut on a couple of occasions. Ken was up in Cambridge Bay recently, and um, over in Economy, I think both of them were. 
and Margaret's crew oversees the commercial big building uh, energy retrofits and uh, those audits. And Ken is predominantly looking at the, the housing stock. And uh, he's one of our energy auditors for the Energy program. And so <clears throat> um, uh, definitely whenever, once we get people engaged in getting in on those audits, their energy literacy, I think, is able to be bumped up a number of levels because of the information that they're able to gain from that. And then depending on where they're at, if they're able to receive it and at least run with it a little bit, uh, then it's, they, they definitely are able to come along fairly well. You got anything to add to that, Lawrence? Um, uh, just, just a couple of the, th this is definitely an underdeveloped space in terms of um, uh, clean energy potential in the north, but uh, just to mention a couple of programs that are, are now doing a great job uh, in the space. One is um, Lumos Energy, which has a 2020 catalyst program, a month uh, uh, program for for anyone from the northern communities who are involved with championing or or uh, developing or operating, managing these pro, uh, clean energy pro projects, so they're uh, they're based on mentorship and collaboration, and the, and these champions move around the country to several different locations and, and get trained. So that's a, that's a fantastic program. Um, the other one is uh, Arctic Council has a program called Arena, which is Arctic Remote Energy Networks Academy. And it's a similar model. It's based out of uh, U Alaska and Fairbanks, um, with connecting international uh, energy champions in the north uh, with um, mentorship, um, uh, bring success stories, that sort of thing. And that's all meant to to bring that capacity back into the communities and have it stay there, so uh, and and sustainably propagate from there. Okay. Um, one of the other questions I see on here. Oh, Jason, you're back. Good. Uh, yeah, I, I can kind of see it, just a sliver of one. It's re related to climate change, so I wonder if you guys could address that. So you're, the understanding some of the critical energy and related issues that Indigenous Canadians are concerned about costs, access, economic opportunities, uh. climate change, and are renewables and electrification the way to go in the north? Go for it, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So understand what some of the critical energy and related issues are that Northern and Indigenous Canadians. Okay, well, you know, on the ground, as uh, for any of you listening from Northern communities, you, you'll know that uh, often the day-to-day -day reality are, are things like you know, health, wellness, um, uh, housing, food security, that sort of thing. So, but when energy is thought about, uh, I have found in my uh, conversations with northern communities that that uh, the issue of self-reliance, autonomy, comes up over and over again. So, part of the structure that communities find themselves in is a is a sort of a default. Uh, indigenous people were brought, were came in off the land uh, through federal government initiatives that said, "Here's a community with." Uh, Here's here's low rental housing and uh, and here are all the advantages of being in a community. Uh, the people who are now in those communities um, find themselves by default in a fossil fuel driven system, and there's frustration around that because because um, it's really a dependent is antithetical to uh, to self reliance and, and autonomy and traditional ways of of, of being within you know help uh, working as a community together to find their resources. So I find that's one issue that comes up over and over again. Um, there's environmental concerns, of course, around climate change uh, that's affecting um, especially the coastal, northern coastal communities, um, and environmental concerns around oil spill um, risk, and environmental concerns about the diesel gensets that are running 24-7 in the middle of a lot of the communities, local air pollution, local noise, um, melting your snow for drinking water that then tastes like fuel, that sort of thing. So there's a whole mix of things uh, and indirectly a lot of northern communities suffer indirectly from the subsidization that's required from Ottawa 
to um, make fuel and power and heat affordable in northern communities. So a massive chunk of federal and then territorial transfer budgets go into um, paying for fossil fuel and subsidizing it to the detriment of health programs, housing programs, that sort of thing. So there's an indirect interest also in the north to, to start chipping away at those subsidies. And, and this isn't just government, this is the northern utilities as well who all have a mandate to decrease dependence on, on imported fossil fuel. Uh, so I do believe, yes, at the end you, you ask, are renewables electrici electrification the way to go in the north? Um, are renewable uh, and clean energy, it, it's a matter of time, but I, I think it's, it's huge importance uh, for our northern communities, not only to follow our, our federal mandate now to decrease dependence on diesel and diesel consumption, but um, but for the way of life uh, and autonomy, self-reliance, uh, and environmental benefit uh, in the communities, and keeping the energy dollars local rather than spending them uh, in a, in a once a year shipment that flows south. Teresa, anything to add to that? Yeah, and I just realized I found where the button was for the video, so you might be able to see me now. Um, I think a couple main things on this are um, uh, as much as yes, there um, are reasons and rationales for pursuing renewables and clean energy options for the North, the, the big important thing, and we, we keep trying to bring everybody back to this, and if I would have been thinking of, if this would have been in my office, I would have had my big poster board behind me and one of the little pictures on it is with this energy pyramid. And so this idea of an energy pyramid and the bottom of the pyramid being the biggest thing that we need to tackle the most which is the energy conservation. So it was great to hear Lawrence talking about those uh, 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 energy saving retrofits in economy. So getting an understanding of where you're at and what your energy usage is and reducing that as much as possible, even if it's just turning things off, having power bars in place, you name it, but on a bigger scale too with you know how we're powering buildings and how we're heating things and whatnot. And then once you get a good solid grasp of that energy conservation and along the way, you need to be working at the next level, which is the energy efficiency. So that's all of the energy in star appliances, that's the programmable thermostats, any of the timer controls, the boiler controls. So when I popped around with Margaret and Leanne and a few others, um, when they're doing these big commercial audits, whatever a MarTech boiler controller is, is really important. And the more that we can get people that are operating these big buildings around the NWT and the North, the more that's going to be helpful. So being able to control what those um, units are doing and when, when they're calling for heat, what they're doing in relation to outside temperatures, etc. And so getting that energy conservation, the energy efficiency, and then you've reduced your loads and your demands, and so then your renewable energy at the top of the, of the pyramid then is the, the thing that can be more properly sized because you've reduced your loads and your demands, and, um, and then you're able to more wisely use what still is uh, fairly uh, expensive renewable and clean energy technologies and um, I'm glad to see that you're talking about renewable technologies more so than clean because there's all these misconstrued things about what's really clean when it's just kind of being given a moniker of clean but um, overall I mean uh, it did get discussed on this because um, uh, well just we only have so much time but there's a, a, a really interesting example of a, a newer project that's come about in the NWT up in Colville Lake. And the uh, Power Corp, the North, Northwest Territories Power Corp, has embarked on a, a hybrid system of a whole swath of solar, and I think it's like 23 or 39 kilowatts. And um, I don't have these numbers memorized. And, and a gigantic battery bank. And so the, the plan and the intention, uh, uh, and actually I think Greenpeace, you know, World Wildlife Fund or Greenpeace has that uh, project highlighted as one of the, the projects that they've highlighted in a case study and the Pembina Institute as well. And, um, and of course information can be found out about that on the NTPC website. But um, uh, I believe that the understanding is that uh, for the course of the summer, the community will very likely be able to be off of its generators for big chunks of time, if not 24 hours and days, um, uh, depending on uh, what's going on in the community and um, 
you know, solar days being good with, you know, clear skies and whatnot. Um, and not smoky. Uh, the one thing that we are uh, coming to know is that uh, the big fires that have been happening and um, uh, unfortunately as significant as they've been over the last three years, um, it sounds like there's still going to be, you know, very strong fire seasons ahead and the smoke does impact uh, the solar production. And so when we might be expecting that, oh, got all this daylight time and whatnot, uh, if there's forest fires in the area, that's going to negate it for some time as well. So yes, the energy pyramid. We need to keep underscoring that energy conservation and the energy efficiency well ahead of the renewables. And we really need to um, underscore that with any of the decision makers at all levels, um, from local governments through to federal and international and whatnot, because you know we keep adding more people, we keep adding expectations of being able to do all these things with our gadgets and our computers. But great, we're doing the Google Hangout, not using airports and airplanes to get us all in the same place. Um, but uh, the more that um, people think, oh, solar, or oh, look at this new technology, great, this is uh, wonderful, this is sexy, let's go for it. But if we're not doing anything to address um, reducing our loads and how we're attacking things and how we're approaching our living, um, we really need to be much more fully adopting DNA principles and sustainability uh, principles into our daily lives and then integrate the renewables into that. Oh, and somebody says they think it's about 130 kilowatts for the um, uh, Colville Lake and a 200 kilowatt battery storage. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron Stewart. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, great. That, that's a unique project, Colville Lake, in that uh, mostly, um, mostly the solar penetration is sized to be 20% or less in, in a community because it's a, it's a noisy signal and there's complications uh, of having it uh, higher than that. But uh, the Colville Lake has gone for quite a high penetration. And as Teresa said, it, it does. In the summer, they're, uh, they're fully on solar. Any other questions? I'm not sure if there is. Yeah, I'm not seeing any myself, but like I said, I'm not the best judge of things from my end here. Um, and we'll wrap this up. I think that um, Lawrence did put up his uh, contact information. If anybody is uh, here and does have any questions for the speakers, I'm happy to direct them. Um, so you can email me. It's uh, uh, Jason, or sorry, J Armstrong at techno-science.ca, or you can through our Let's Talk Energy.ca website. You can uh, you can reach out to us. Um, of course, you can also always find us uh, uh, on Facebook. We have a web uh, page there, and also on Twitter. Uh, if you uh, use the uh, handle at Entertweets, uh, you will you will reach us. And uh, I wanted to thank take some time just to thank both of our speakers, uh, Lawrence and uh, Teresa. And Teresa, like I said, coming in at the last moment. Uh, it's great to hear. Your expertise. This is something for for those of us down in, in the southern part of the country. Uh, I think a lot of us don't even think about the reality of getting energy up into these more remote communities and the challenges that presents. So thanks for showing your expertise. Um, I wanted to also mention next month uh, we're going to be working with a couple of people whose expertise is in natural gas, and we'll be talking about the role that natural gas can play as uh, a transitional fuel uh, and moving away from some coal generation in some of the provinces in the country. Uh, and also we wanted to look at some of the different innovations that's uh, making gas extraction uh, more environmentally friendly and what the effects of the current low prices are on both producers and consumers. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to mention is for those of you who might be around Ottawa this summer, uh, our initiative, the Let's Talk Energy initiative, has been working with National Geographic and we're producing a photo-based exhibit on the topic of climate change, the science of it, uh, some of the effects, and also looking at some different uh, technologies, innovations, behaviors that can help address the challenges pre presented by climate change. So we're going to be, uh, it's an outdoor exhibit, it'll be at Lansdowne Park here in Ottawa, and after that we're hoping to travel it to some of our museum and science center partners across the country. So uh, you should be able to find more about that uh, on our website in the coming weeks. We'll be installing it in two weeks, and then we'll have uh, all the photos and kind of a virtual tour for those of you who want to check that out. 
So thanks everyone for joining us, and again, thank you to both of our presenters. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks very much. All right, thank you very much.